I love the language choice here. It sounds so innocuous, like they're dabbling in Bitcoin. They've got 8.7 trillion AUM, and they're dabbling in a cryptocurrency that's currently valued at like $53,000 a coin. They're dabbling. That's not dabbling, that's investing. Come on, guys. Hey everybody, Walrus here from Walrus Street, bringing you your news for the week of February 22nd, 2021. Just a reminder, I am not a financial professional. All information in this video is for entertainment purposes only. Well, that was not a fun week to be watching a portfolio. I don't know about you guys, but like 90% of my holdings spent the entire week in the red and it was just sad, sad times. I think the S&P ended up closing the week 30 points lower than it opened the week. We're in that time, we're in a red time. This is the kind of time where you want to be a little more cautious with your investments. You don't want to be buying into bad companies and you want to make sure that you are finding and hunting for value. Typically when the market does drop like this, there are a lot of value purchases to be made. Now to be clear, this wasn't exactly a huge drop, but it was a drop nonetheless. Let's get started with the news for the week. For anybody who's new to the channel, I do publish all my technical analysis every week. It's not the greatest technical analysis, but it is my practice and I am just sharing it with you guys. The link is going to be below the video. I did add some Sidious Pharmaceuticals, CTXR, onto the analysis this week. Since I did cover it last week and I did buy in, please note that not all of my holdings are represented on this list, only the ones that I'm interested in following the TA for. First news story, BlackRock's Rick Ryder says the world's largest asset manager has started to dabble in Bitcoin. Rick Ryder is the CIO of BlackRock. For anybody who's not aware, BlackRock is the largest investment manager in the world. They currently have about 8.6 7 trillion US dollars in assets under management. And I love the language choice here. It sounds so innocuous, like they're dabbling in Bitcoin. They've got 8.7 trillion AUM and they're dabbling in a cryptocurrency that's currently valued at like $53,000 a coin. They're dabbling. That's not dabbling, that's investing. Come on guys. I mean, dabbling is like what I do with archery. I dabble in archery. I go shoot arrows once a week, I dabble. No, you're investing in Bitcoin. It's okay. Okay, don't be afraid to say investing because it's a cryptocurrency. It's, it's a sign of the times. You can say investing. I wouldn't put a number on the percentage allocation one should have. It depends on what the rest of your portfolio looks like, obviously. Today, the volatility of it is extraordinary, but people are looking for storehouses of value. People are looking for places that could appreciate under the assumption that inflation moves higher and that debts are building. So we've started to dabble a bit in it. This is kind of like what everybody who invests and cryptocurrency already knows. Inflation is getting out of hand, especially with COVID. The US is printing more money. A lot of countries are printing more money. And investing into crypto is one way to combat inflation, especially a cryptocurrency with a fixed number of coins, like the fact that Bitcoin only has 21 million coins. There's not going to be any more made. A lot of cryptocurrencies by nature are deflationary. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to dump on Uber. I know I, I've talked about Uber now like three weeks in a row, but this was kind of a big story. One of the reasons that I don't don't like Uber is because they treat their drivers like slaves. They don't pay them a good wage. They don't offer them any expense coverage for their vehicle. Uber is just having people use their own vehicles, add miles onto their own vehicles, their own wear and tear. And then Uber is providing a software platform, which is nice. But I feel like the drivers of Uber are not fairly compensated, especially the ones that don't live in urban areas. So this is in the UK. Uber loses the UK ruling on drivers in blow to gig economy. Economy. Now, this was in the UK Supreme Court. The judges unanimously ruled that Uber drivers are workers entitled to rights like minimum wage, holiday pay, and rest breaks. Uber shares dropped as much as 1.5% in early trading in New York before pairing losses. The ruling will have a significant impact on the UK's burgeoning gig economy and comes amid a broader global fight for the rights of workers on apps. Many of the companies that rely on these types of workers have thrived during the global pandemic, deploying drivers to make deliveries to customers stuck at home while shops and restaurants were shuttered. Now, this is hardly the first city that Uber has been in a legal battle in for the driver's payments, even just for the right to provide its service. However, this is a nationwide ruling about the rights that Uber drivers should have. And also, this extends to other gig-based work. That's a very broad statement. You think of Lyft, maybe you think of Fiverr, maybe you think of other companies like that. But this kind of sets a precedent where any of these types of gig-based apps are going to have to pay 
pay at least a minimum wage in the UK going into the future. This affected Uber, but this is actually a little further reaching than that. Next up, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway reveals three new secret buys. Oh. What a mystery. Berkshire Hathaway revealed three stock acquisitions that it snapped up in secret. There's nothing secret. They have to report all of their purchases eventually, including new bets on Chevron, Verizon, and an insurance brokerage called Marsh and McLennan. To free up funding for this, they cut their Apple stake, exited JP Morgan and Chase, PNC Financial Services, M&T Bank Group, and slashed their Wells Fargo holding stake by 59%. A lot of you guys might think that Warren Buffett kind of lost his touch because of what he did with the airlines last year. That was just a bit of a mistake, obviously. This guy is still legendary. Warren Buffett is, in my opinion, and the opinion of many others, the greatest value investor of all time. So when he invests into companies like Verizon, where he's been in and out of a position before, invests into a relatively small insurance company like Marsh and McLennan, and invests into Chevron, it really makes you stop and think. A lot of people think oil is done. I think oil is a value investment purchase if you get a vertically integrated company. Vertical integration in oil is known as a company that has upstream, midstream, downstream. Upstream is actually pulling the oil out of the ground. Midstream is piping and trucking. Downstream is refining. Companies that have all of those are the larger oil plays like Chevron, like Exxon, like BP, like Royal Dutch Shell. Those are the companies that are really trading at a value right now and they haven't recovered their prices since the Russia-Saudi oil feud, since coronavirus. They're are kind of just sitting here at these low valuations and I totally understand, at least for Chevron's sake, why Buffett snapped them up. I'm not saying all oil is a good investment. A lot of the smaller oil producers are really in trouble because they are not vertically integrated. Maybe they only focus on the upstream side and they're paying these huge land taxes. So not all oil companies, but the big ones are definitely a value right now. Next up, for any of my GameStop investor friends, I want you guys to go ahead and listen to this. I have not actually played a clip on my channel yet, but I just want you guys to listen to about 50 seconds of this and then we're going to talk about it. This is Interactive Brokers CEO Thomas Peterfee. This is before the congressional hearing this week. In addition, there were about one and a half million calls, which would call for 150 million shares. When the shorts, when, if the shorts, uh, sorry, if the longs repay their margin loans and exercise the calls, their brokers would have had to be, would have been obligated by the rules as they are today to deliver to them 270 million shares while they on, by only 50 million shares existed. So when the shorts cannot deliver the shares, the broker representing the longs must, must by the rules of the system go into the market and buy the shares at any price, pushing the price into the thousand into the thousands. Now, I know a lot of people that did not invest in GameStop thought that the $1,000 per share was a joke, was a meme. This is the first time that we've actually had a CEO basically come on air saying the financial system was close to a collapse. The morning where trading was halted, where buying was halted for retail for GameStop, shares were up around, what, $450, $480, something like that. And then retail buying stopped. And he's saying, basically, if that was allowed to continue, the share price would have pushed up into the thousands and would have broke the financial system. This is kind of what everybody was saying. And I know a lot of people that weren't in GameStop were like kind of thinking that it was like a cult, you know, the short squeeze thing, ha ha ha. No, this is legitimate. And the CEOs of these big firms, these brokers, these traders, these hedge funds, everyone was aware of this. This is just the first time that somebody's come on air and said it in the thousands per share. Next up, last week I touched on Walmart being a great value. They had their earnings report and it was a record fourth quarter for revenues as their e-commerce sales boomed and then the shares promptly dipped six and a half percent because that's what you do. When a company you're investing in puts out a successful quarter, naturally you just sell it. Walmart posted strong fourth quarter sales driven by booming e-commerce sales. We talked about e-commerce last week. Share price dropped to 137.66. Their revenues increased seven percent percent to 152 billion on a year-on-year -year basis and this was higher than the analyst expectations of 148 billion adjusted earnings increased marginally to $1.39 per share but they missed the estimates of $1.51 e-commerce sales surged 69 percent 
The company announced a hike in its annual dividend by almost 2% to 220 per share, reflecting a quarterly dividend of 55 cents per share. This marks the company's 48th consecutive year of dividend increases. The company's annual dividend now reflects a dividend yield of 1.6%. So not only is Walmart a value play with most analysts projecting around $162 a share, which is like 16% higher than what it's trading at right now, but also they've increased their dividend now for 48 consecutive consecutive years. So you're getting a value play per share and you're getting an increasing dividend. Now I know 1.6% isn't super high yet, but the company's been investing into e-commerce and growth in that way. Palantir also reported their earnings. Palantir posted a 40% revenue growth along with an adjusted operating income of 104 million, which was higher than expected and a big improvement over the previous year. For the full year, the company posted 47% growth on the back of 77% growth in government customers and it guided for a reacceleration of 45% growth for the first quarter of 2021. Last year, 47% growth for the entire fiscal 2020, and Palantir is projecting a 45% growth for just the first quarter of 2021. This is insane. And then the stocks promptly dropped 12.5%. Now, a lot of that was probably because of the lockup expiring, but there was even more good news this week. Palantir gets an upgrade to buy at Goldman on sales guidance. Goldman Sachs upgraded shares of the data analytics company to buy from neutral. If you've been following it, you know Wall Street's been really tough on Palantir. The new price target from Goldman for Palantir is $34 a share, up from 13 eh, pretty significant. Also, Kathy Wood's ARC Innovation bought the dip in Palantir. ARC took advantage of Palantir's lockup expiry-related decline yesterday, being Friday, adding more than 5 million shares, which more than doubled the fund's stake. This ended up bringing up the shares of Palantir 7.4%. Even in after-hours trading on Friday, Palantir was back up to 29. When some of the insiders sold their shares after lockup, up expiry, which is totally understandable. ARC came in and ended up buying 5 million shares. Okay. All right. That's a good vote of confidence. So we've got Goldman upgrading projections and ARC buying 5 million shares. All right. Let's take a look at the earnings coming up for this week. We've got earnings season kind of slowing down. All the FANG stocks are done, but there's still some interesting companies. Home Depot and Lowe's had really great years with everybody stuck at home, but typically they decline a little bit in the winter. I know a lot of people are excited about Square and Jumia. I don't really care about them, but I know people are excited. Moderna, of course, with the COVID situation, everybody Everybody's going to be looking at that. My baby Rocket is reporting. I've talked about this before. Rocket's profit margin is insane. They sign up more people to mortgages. They have fewer employees. It's an efficient company. So I'm expecting them to rise up until earnings like every other company and then drop right afterwards. Cleveland Cliffs, I'm going to be following that along with Vail because I am in Steel Gang. We have Space Virgin Galactic reporting. Nikola still has not made any revenue. Remember the downhill truck from Nikola? You've got Royal Caribbean and Six Flags here. These are obviously like pandemic plays where they just haven't really had revenue. So they're of course going to be reporting terrible earnings, but everybody expects it by now. Same thing with Norwegian Cruise Lines. Magnite is one that I'm going to be looking at specifically. Last week I followed the trade desk. This week I am going to be looking at Magnite, which is another digital ad company. I want to show you the effect Warren Buffett's announcement of Berkshire Hathaway buying into Chevron that the announcement had before the announcement on February 16th. We closed the day at 93. Then the announcement happened after hours. And the next day we opened at 95, 38 and traded and closed at 95, 93 that day. We even peaked midday at 96, 72. So just the announcement of Warren Buffett taking that interest in this company ended up increasing the share price by like 6%, something like that, 7%. Really impressive just from one announcement. That's one reason it's really hard to do TA on stocks because one big news announcement throws your entire TA thesis out the window. And people couldn't have predicted that Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway was going to buy into Chevron with that much. Here's Walmart. This is where they closed before their earnings. They closed at $147 a share. And then after they reported their earnings, they closed the next day at 137. They lost $10 in their per share price, even dropping further than that actually midday. It's really crazy how people just 
just look at the EPS. I don't know if this is the motivation, but they didn't do as well as they thought they would EPS, but still they had a 69% increase in e-commerce and they had a revenue beat off expectations. I don't understand this drop at all. So anyway, Walmart's coming in dirt cheap. Here's Palantir. This was on earnings. We had a drop on earnings and then we had another drop leading into the lockup expiry. And then we ended up raising up the next day. Trade Desk reported earnings. And now this is where I'm getting into this week's. Trade Desk reported a massive earnings beat. And when it did that between Thursday, Friday, we went from $845 on the close up to $903 on the close. This was a nutty increase, a $50 increase per share in one day because of their earnings beat. Another one that I didn't really talk about, this one just IPO'd on February 10th. This is Viant Technology. This is another ad company. And you can see on Friday, it ended up shooting up. This is the kind of rise by association where Trade Desk had a huge earning beat in the digital ad industry. So other companies also had positive days, such as Viant. And the one that's reporting earnings this week, Magnite. So you can see Magnite here. Magnite actually had a couple of pretty rough days in a row. But then Friday, when the Trade Desk reported those big earnings, Magnite ended up having a $5 price per share increase. And then Magnite ends up reporting this week. Last one I kind of want to look at, and I want to zoom out on this one, is Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean is a cruise line. And you can see leading up to the worst day of COVID. Royal Caribbean was just tanking every day. Before COVID got really, really bad, it was trading around 135 a share, and this was like January 2020. And we dropped from 135 all the way down here to $19 a share. It's slowly been going up after this. And the weird thing about this is, every time it reports earnings, even though the earnings are terrible and worse than expected, gap up, raise, you know, big green candle, raise. So we have another earnings report here, but we've already been going up, like kind of running up into the earnings report for this. And we ended up closing on Friday at like $79 a share. They're really not running cruises. They only have two ships active right now. These are all of the updates. They kept delaying their cruises, delaying their cruises, canceling cruises all throughout the year. The latest update we've had from Royal Caribbean is that they've gone beyond April 2021 and suspended operations until the start of May 2021. This announcement was made on January 12th, but it does exclude two ships in the fleet. Those two ships are the Spectrum of the Seas, based out of China, and the Quantum of the Seas, which is based out of Singapore. The Quantum of the Seas one, this is kind of funny, going out of Singapore, they're doing cruises to nowhere at 50% capacity, where the cruise ship just leaves Singapore, goes and floats around the ocean for three days, and comes back to Singapore, because they can't clear and go to any ports. You've got what's probably going to be another horrible earnings report, but the company has seemed to rise after every earnings report this year, and it's had a run-up leading up to it. So I don't really know what to make of this. Obviously, we expect it to be bad. Maybe people are banking on Royal Caribbean's future, and that's why they're getting back into the stock. I mean, we're almost at $80 after dropping to $20. We're not quite at the high of $135, but I guess people are just banking on the future of the company, and they're happy to see any revenue. So this is one that it'll be interesting to see how bad their earnings report is, and then how the stock reacts. All right, everybody. Everybody. That's all I have for the news today. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. I will be publishing my new DD Monday morning at 9.45 Eastern Time, February 22nd. I strongly advise you guys to watch that whole video before just running in and buying the stock. There's a lot of necessary information in that one, so you fully understand the risks involved. I know a lot of you are really good, intelligent investors, and you don't just pile into a stock when I make a video, but I also know that a lot of people do. So I strongly suggest you watch the entire video before just blindly buying in when I post it. I know you guys trust me, but this one is a risky one. You guys saw I was using Webull this week for a lot of my charts. If you are interested in supporting my channel, one of the best ways you could do it is to use my Webull referral link below the video. If you use that referral link, you get a free stock, I get a free stock, everybody's happy. Since I'm in their partner program, the stock that I'm getting is a little higher in value. That's really a nice way to support my channel. I've had a lot of growth on the channel this week, and I've had a lot lot of people asking me if I'm going to do a paid Discord, paid Patreon, anything like that. I know I covered this a couple weeks ago, but my answer is no. I still have not changed my mind. I want everybody to have the same equitable access to my information as soon as I post it on YouTube. I want to grow my YouTube channel. The YouTube ad revenue is sufficient for me. I'm very happy with it. And if you guys wanted to donate money to me, to send money to me, what would make me happiest is if you just took that money and you invested it into your
yourself, invest it into your own future, keep playing the stock market. That would make me most happy. If you really wanna support the channel, like I said, you could use the Weeble referral link or just share my videos on social media. Help my channel grow and that gives me a little more YouTube ad revenue. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and if you wanna be alerted to all my content as soon as it goes live, make sure you hit that notification bell. Thank you so much, I'll see you later.